Bibles, turn to the book of Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3. Title of the message today, Finding God's Way in a Dark Day. Or I've given a subtitle, What You Need More Than Anything in 2021. Actually, you could say what you need more than anything else at any time. But especially this year, uh, 2021. Whatever, whatever you need or want, you don't need it as badly as you need wisdom. That's the thing that you need more than anything else. Need a new house? Not badly as you need wisdom. Need a new car? Not badly as, as badly as you need wisdom. Need a new job? Not as badly as you need wisdom. Need a mate? I didn't say a new one. <laughs> so if you thought that, need a mate? Not badly as you need wisdom. Need a solution to a problem? Only wisdom will truly have the solution uh, to that, that problem. Proverbs chapter 3, verses uh, 5 through 18 is going to be our text this morning. Let me read those verses through to you. Proverbs chapter 3, beginning with verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It shall be health to thy navel and marrow to thy bones. Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, even as a father the son in whom he delighteth. Happy is the man that findeth wisdom and the man that getteth understanding. For the merchandise of it is better than the merchandise of silver and the gain thereof than fine gold. She is more precious than rubies and all the things thou canst desire and not to be compared unto her. Length of days is in her right hand and in her left hand riches and honor. Her ways are ways of pleasantness and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to them that lay hold upon her and happy is everyone that retaineth her. May the Lord add his blessing to his word this morning. Verse 15 there is the verse that really grabs my attention. Wisdom is more precious than rubies. Of all the things that you can desire, none of those can be compared to her. You need to wisely emphasize the priority of wisdom to your children and, and to your grandchildren. It's one of the greatest things that we can do is lead them to seek wisdom in their life. Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 7 tells us that wisdom is the thing that we need the most. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. Get with wisdom and with all you're getting, get understanding. Knowledge is knowing things. It's it's knowing stuff and uh, details and the options that you have. But wisdom is knowing what to do with that knowledge and when and how to do it. In fact, better is a little knowledge with a lot of wisdom than a lot of knowledge with a little wisdom. Knowledge is knowing what words can be said. But wisdom is knowing whether or not to say them and when and how uh, to say them. We can say that wisdom is, is seeing life like the God who made it sees it. You know, like if you take your car to a mechanic, they know how your engine works. God knows how life works. Wisdom sees problems and then calculates what happens if this is done or this is done or this is done. Takes into account all of those things. And in fact, only wisdom can give true and precise answers to man's problems and make the difficult decisions in life. You need to ask God for wisdom, as James chapter 1 and verse 5 says. If any of you lack wisdom, you should ask of God, and God gives it liberally 
to all men. He does not hold back. When, he asks for, when you ask for wisdom, you can be sure that he will give you wisdom. But make sure that you are seeking God's wisdom and not the wisdom of this world. There is a difference. We need the wisdom that God, that God has. Uh, you, you can't be successful and happy in life. You can't have that successful and happy outcome without godly wisdom. We all know the story of, of Solomon and came uh, to him one day, two mothers, two, two women really, each claiming to, baby, to be the baby's mother. And he's in a, a dilemma here. He needs wisdom. Who's the rightful mother of this child? And so you know the story. He takes out a sword like he's going to slay that child. And, and the one mother spoke up and said, no, spare the child. And he knew that that was the real mother because she would rather give up the baby than let it be put to death. And in our text today, Proverbs 13 uh, through 18, these verses here, it's really, it's really a beatitude. It tells us how to be happy. It tells us how to be successful in life. It's similar to what Jesus taught on the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, Mount. Remember, he would start, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are uh, those that mourn. Blessed are the peacemakers. And, and all of these, these blessings that come to those who have this particular attitude in their life. They are happy. They are blessed. And the beatitude gives a practical promise of reward. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall seek God. Blessed are they hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall see God. And even here we find these, this beatitude that has an exclamation mark at the end of it. Uh, because we find here the, the gains that come to those who seek wisdom. In other words, wisdom has a happy outcome. And the, that's the emphasis in these verses, having a happy outcome. There's, there's a number of things mentioned here. There's, there's fabulous wealth, things that, that you may desire. Now, not all wealth in, in, in life is, is, is monetary, is, is those kinds of riches, but he does says that you can have wisdom and it's more important than precious gems or gold or, or silver. And as the text suggests, these things cannot compare to wisdom. They can't be equal to wisdom. They can't even be likened to wisdom. And when you seek wisdom, you are seeking something that is off the charts. That is, that is something that is attainable, but it is something that is, that is unbelievably important in your life. Then the, the promise here, the happy outcome, longevity, perhaps even more to be, de -cher to be cherished was the longevity, or verse 16, the length of days and honor or, or glory in the community that accompanies such a blessing. Smooth, peaceful paths. We're going to get back to that. Uh, at, toward the end of the message today. But it's also compared to a life-producing tree. She is a life-producing tree full of nourishment, full of that which you need to sustain you, to sustain the weary and the hungry travelers who eat out of its produce and stretch out under its shade. And then happiness. It comes full circle here. Happy is the final line that points again to the beginning of the Beatitude, which is wrapped top and bottom with this, with this theme of happiness and blessedness. Now, the opposite of happiness, the opposite of this blessing that we get from these Beatitudes is the word woe. That's what Jesus did for us in Luke's Gospel the woes followed the Beatitudes. So he's saying you can be happy in life, you can have success in life, or you can have woe. And it depends on what you seek after, what you are striving for. My hope and prayer for you today is that for you, wisdom becomes irresistible. That, that you want wisdom above all else and you will seek wisdom in your life. That's why I put all these slides up here at the beginning. So that you will, you will see the importance of wisdom and you will make getting wisdom a priority in your life for this year and in the years to come. Because the alternative is what? It's woe. I don't think any of us want woe. We want God's blessing. We want 
his happiness in life. Erwin Lutzer, he was talking about the, really the opposite of this when he said, in Eden, the devil sold slavery to Adam and Eve, but called it independence. He sold them wisdom, but it turned out to be mental darkness. He put forth a beautiful vision of who they could become, but his offer was sweetly poisoned. He promised them fulfillment and gave them guilt. He appealed to their pride and gave them despair and an empty life. He promised like a god, but paid them like the devil he was. But notice here, he says, those without God's wisdom have mental darkness. Mental darkness leads to woe. It leads to all kinds of trouble. In fact, without God's wisdom, what you do is you fall for the devil's propaganda. Now, these are our dark days for those who do not know the truth and are without God's wisdom. When you think about what is happening in our nation, history is being re rewritten to control the future. Satan is using diversity to divide us. He is preaching that socialism is the cure. Should a Biden-Harris administration come into being, do you know that there are many that are already lining up to seek their favor? For example, there is the secular Democrats of America whose goals would assault your religious liberty. Then there's the human rights campaign with their push for LGBTQ indoctrination, acceptance, and promotion. In addition to these two groups, there's a third organization, the Council on American Islamic Relations, CAIR. They put forth a 38-page document called Restoring the Rights of American Muslims and Advancing Justice for All Americans. Sounds good until you realize who this council is and what they stand for. They are a front group that, birthed, that was birthed by the Muslim Brotherhood, and the Muslim Brotherhood, it was deny, deemed a terrorist organization in Egypt, the United Kingdom, and the United Arab Emirates. But they have made an incredible advancement into the U.S. government. And I'm telling you, this is a dark day if you only see from the physical world. That's why last week I said, remember, you've got to have spiritual eyes. If you are going to survive, if you are going to be successful, if you are actually going to be on the offensive, and we're going to be fruitful uh, Christians in a church that's on the move, we have to see with another set of eyes. We can't g see just the physical. We have to see the spiritual. And we have to see what God is doing despite all of this. And whenever you hear things like, like I just mentioned, I'd like you to remember two words this year, all right? But God. Think of those two words. Yeah, I hear this, and people are talking about darkness, and I know what these organizations are up to, but God. There's still a God that sits on the throne. There's still a God who is in control. And Jesus Christ is his name, and he is the ultimate ruler, and God is the sovereign God of the universe. We cannot forget that. But let me back up to verses 5 and 6, which are the key verses in this chapter. The Bible tells us clearly and plainly that in all of our ways, if we would acknowledge him, he will direct our paths. That God will lead us and we will know his will for our lives. Now remember, he has a will for your individual life. God doesn't make copies. He only makes originals. Look at your neighbor. They are an original. There'll never be another one just like them. <laughs> they are not going to be a copy. God has a will for me and God has a will for you. And God has as many methods as he has men and women. But he does have one purpose in your life and mine. And that purpose is the same for you as it is for me. You know what that purpose is? Jesus. That we will be conformed into the image of God's precious son. And he has a plan that is uniquely tailored for your life and my life to make that happen. So I want to talk for a few moments today on, on letting God direct our lives, to have a God-directed way, to find God's way in the dark day in which we are living. First of all, first of all, I want you to see that there should be a trusting confidence. Now notice in whom we're to trust Trust in the Lord. 
with all of your heart. I don't have some scheme here today. I don't have a program that I'm going to ask you to subscribe to. It's not a plan. It's not a program. It's not a philosophy. I'm asking you to trust a person. Okay? And his name is Jesus. And he's the only one that we ought to trust in. And so we trust him with all of our heart. Now you find it difficult, uh, if you find it difficult to trust in the Lord with all your heart, if you would say, you know what, I have a half-hearted trust. I'm going to tell you why that's the case. And you might not like what you're going to hear this morning. But I'll tell you, if you have a difficulty trusting in the Lord, if that is you, I, Pastor, yeah, that's me. I have, I have difficulty trusting in the Lord with all my heart. You know why? It's because you don't love the Lord like you should. And I don't say that to be mean. I just say that to get you to realize that you need to love the Lord more. You see, you can't trust a person you don't love. I mean, have you ever had a complete stranger come up to you and say, hey, will you do th something for me? If somebody came up to me, a complete stranger, and said, would you do something for me? What would I going to say? I'm going to say, what is it? I'm not just going to blanketly say, yeah, I'll do it. I'm going to say, well, what is it? And um, suppose that stranger says, well, never mind, just trust me. Will you do it? No. I'd say, no, you're going to have to tell me what it is first. And then maybe I'll do it. I don't know who you are. I, I don't know what you might ask me to do. But now suppose my wife comes to me and says, Rick, will you do something for me? And I say, what is it? And she says, never mind, just trust me. I probably wouldn't do it either. No, I would do it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I would do it. I would do it. My question, though, my question would be, what do you want me to do? But if she were to say, never mind, what is it, just trust me, I love her enough, I know that she loves me enough that she's not going to do something that's going to harm me or embarrass me or put me in a position that is not for my welfare or for my good. I, I believe I would say, what first? And then, yes, I will do it because I love you and because I trust you. Now, why don't we love God? It's because we don't know him like we should. If, if you knew him, you would love him because he's altogether lovely. He's altogether trustworthy. The, the people who do not love him are the people who really don't know him. Because how could you not know him and not love him? But then why do you not know him? It's because you're not spending time with him. You know, you can't love somebody that you don't spend time with. The people that you love, you spend time with them. You get to know them. And that's the way it is with God. And as we come to know him, we come to love him. And as we come to love him, we come to trust him. And as we come to trust him, we come to obey him. And as we obey him, we are blessed of him. So trust in the Lord with all of your heart, but don't lean on your own understanding. Now, it's not that God doesn't want us to understand he just doesn't want us to lean on our own understanding. Verse 7 makes that clear. Be not wise in your own eyes. In verse 7, verse 12, uh, there is a way which seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of what? Death. Don't lean on your own understanding, but instead trust God. Going back to this idea of, of uh propaganda because if we don't have God's wisdom we are mentally dark Eric Hoffer says that propaganda does not deceive people it merely helps them to deceive themselves the devil's propaganda and there is a lot of that in our culture today helps people who lean on their own understanding to deceive themselves you ever wonder why there's so much deception in the world today you ever look at it and say, how could people not see that? It's because they have been deceived. They have leaned onto their own understanding, and they want to believe a certain way, and because of that propaganda, they fall for it. Edward Barnes, Barney rather, said, propaganda takes many different forms. Sometimes it hides the truth. 
Sometimes it uses half-truths. Sometimes it distorts the truth by the selective use of facts or history. Or it uses one-sided assertions. Almost always it seeks to present its argument by appealing to a higher goal, such as the common good, or it's a matter of rights or justice. It claims the high moral ground and is sold as a noble cause. Christians, we need to be very careful here because we are being manipulated by noble causes. The devil preaches noble goals, but he hides his end game. And we are being led step by step. Isn't that what the devil said to Adam and Eve in the garden? You eat of this fruit, you shall become as gods, knowing good and evil. He never told them the end result of that. He doesn't reveal the end game. He tries to deceive us through, narrow, or through these um, noble causes. It is interesting, the prophet Jeremiah said it's not in man to direct his steps, and he's right. But that doesn't mean we're not to understand. It means we're not to lean upon our own understanding. In uh, Proverbs chapter 2, uh, beginning with verse 1, My son, if you will receive my word and hide my commandments with you, so that you incline your ear unto wisdom and apply your heart to, what's that next word? Understanding. Understanding. If you seek her as silver and search for her as for hid treasures, then you shall understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom, out of his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. And so number one, if you want to find God's way in a dark day, if you want to know the will and the way of God for your life, there must be a trusting confidence. Not a self-confidence, but a confidence in God. Trust in the Lord. The second thing you need is a total commitment. Verse 6, in all your ways, acknowledge him. In all your ways, totally and completely acknowledge him as Lord over every area of your life. Acknowledge him as the one who is sovereign, as the one whose right it is to rule over your life. It means I acknowledge him in my business. I acknowledge him in my recreational life. I acknowledge him in my domestic, my home life. I acknowledge him in my worship life. I acknowledge him in my leisure time. I acknowledge him in all of my ways. Not some of my ways, but in all of my ways, I am to acknowledge him. There is to be a total commitment to Jesus Christ if you're going to find God's way on a dark day. You know what you need to do? And this is hard. I know it. You need to it's like give God a blank check, only sign it and say, God, you fill it in. I'm willing to commit myself totally to you. Are you willing to sign the, the bottom of a contract and say, here, Lord, I give you my life and I trust you. You might have heard of Dr. Olford, uh, Stephen Olford. When he was a young man, he was raised in Africa. He was the son of missionary parent, parents. He was a brilliant boy. He decided he wanted to pursue a course in engineering. And he went to an engineering school, one of the finest schools in all the world. And at that school, he was a top student. He got straight A's. His plan was to become a successful engineer, to go back to Africa to have leisure, to have the nice things that money could buy. And the noble goal was to help the missionaries and, and work for God on the side. It seemed like a real fine plan to him. He's the one that worked it up in his own mind, though. I mean, if this is what God had called him to do, this would be, this would be great. But this is what he thought. This was his own understanding. It all seemed good. He had it all set up. He, he's leaning there on his own understanding. It's all worked out. Great plan for my life. His father was back in Africa and Oldford was away in school and he got sick. And he went to the doctor and, and uh, he's really, he's better. And actually the doctor came to him. The doctor came to his bedside and said, young man, in two weeks you will be dead. His life just caved in around him. All of his plans for his life died that day. And here he was leaning on his own understanding, making his own plans. And while he's on that deathbed, a letter came from his missionary dad. And you know, in those days, it took months, perhaps even, for mail to, to travel. And the dad had no way of knowing the condition of his son and the condition his son would be in when this letter arrived. 
But in that letter, Stephen Olford's dad said to him these words. You've probably heard them and quoted them. Perhaps they even become trite to us. But his dad said to him, "'Tis but one life will soon be passed, and only what's done for Christ will last." And God broke through uh, to this young man, and he bowed his head, and he prayed this prayer. I want you to listen to what he said. Only three words in it. Three-word prayer. Anywhere, anytime, any cost. Anywhere, anytime, any cost. Would you be willing to pray that prayer? Would you be willing to say to the Lord today, Lord, anywhere, anytime, any cost? You say, I'd be afraid to do, to do that. I just, I'd be afraid to give God a blank check. I'd be afraid to pray that prayer. You know why? Because you're not trusting him with all your heart. And you really don't know him like you should. Because to know him is to love him. And to realize his love for you. And to realize that Romans 8.28 is true. All things work together for good, right? To those who love God and are called according to his purposes. Don't be afraid of the will of God. God is, is not going to do have you do something that you don't want to do. Well, pastor, he might call me to be a missionary in Africa. I'll tell you, if he calls you to be a missionary in Africa, that is exactly what you're going to want to do. God is able to change our hearts, work our hearts, so that our will lines up with his will. And I like somebody said this one time that has always stuck with me. God's will is exactly what I would choose if I knew all the details. If I knew everything there was to know, if I was all knowing like God, I would choose exactly what he has chosen for me. And then the third point to the message this morning is a thrilling consequence. Because if we have a trusting confidence and we make that total commitment there will be a thrilling consequence. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. He will direct our paths. Um, I see several things this morning about that verse. First of all, there's going to be divine direction. God is going to say to you, this is the way. Walk ye in it. He will direct your path. Can God speak to you? Yes, you can believe that God will speak to you. How will he speak to you? Well, there are a number of ways. Let me suggest uh, a couple here this morning. One way that God will speak to you is through his word, through, through the written word. We know in the book of Proverbs, or the book of Psalms, rather, it says in Psalm 119, verse 105, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. How am I going to find God's way in a dark day? Well, by getting into God's word, because God's word is going to be a lamp unto my feet. It's going to be a light unto my path. I'm going to know by the word of God. For example, much of the word of God is already revealed in his word. The moral choices that you and I make, he has already laid out his will for us there. But I'll tell you another way, and that is God will speak directly to your heart when you pray and ask God for wisdom. You know, something has happened to me two weeks in a row here now. First of all, Josh stole my message last week, and today Tanya stole it in Sunday school. She's talking about, talking about the rhema of God, the, the, the word of God that comes to us. Not necessarily the spoken word, but the revealed word. And God does speak to the human heart. He's going to communicate to our spirit. Let me give you some examples. When, when Judas fell by transgression, the apostles wanted to know who was going to take Judas's place. And in Acts chapter 1, uh, in verse 24, they prayed and they said, Lord, you know the hearts of all men. Show us which of these two you have chosen. Lord, you know everyone's heart. You know who we should pick. You know, you know our heart. Show us, Lord. Speak to us. Speak to our heart. The person that you have chosen. And God does that. And God gives wisdom when we pray. And he lets us know the choices that we should make. He often speaks in the quietness of our heart. That's, a reason, that's the reason why prayer needs to be a two-way street. We're not just talking at God when we pray. We are listening and letting God speak to us, speak to our hearts as well. Um, you say, oh, <laughs> 
But God, again, might speak to me and, and some, say something that I don't, I don't want to hear. Let me tell you this. It's God who works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. First of all, God puts it in your will. You want to do what God is telling you to do, and then he gives you the power to do it. That is an incredible thing. Jesus Christ said, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me. My meat, my bread, my, my butter is to do the will of him that sent me. In uh, Acts chapter 8 and 29, verse 29, another example, the Spirit said uh, to Philip, go to this chariot and, and stay with it. So here's Deacon Wilderness, or Philip, he's out in the wilderness. He's, uh, he, he's traveling along and God says, the Spirit said, the Spirit spoke to him. Well, how did that happen? You think he said, Philip, this is, this is the Lord, go over there? He might have been, might have said it that way. Or maybe he just spoke to his heart and Philip was in tune. He was in, he was in the stream of the Spirit and he was impressed in his heart to go. Often that's the way God works in our life. He just impresses something on our hearts. And I think we miss God a lot of times because we are, we're expecting something dramatic to happen. We, we're expecting to, to hear an audible voice, perhaps. We're expecting lightning to come down from the sky. And God just speaks quietly to our heart and impresses something on our heart that we need to do or that we need to say. And don't be afraid don't be afraid to step out from God, for God. And you know, the more you do that, the more you will recognize and the quicker you will recognize that this is the Spirit of God that is, that is speaking to you. And again, in Acts chapter 13 and verse 2, the church is praying, seeking God's way to spread the gospel. And the Bible says, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. And the great missionary enterprise of Barnabas and Saul was started when the Holy Spirit spoke to the church communally. He spoke to the, spoke to the looks like to the whole group there. And he said, this is what you are to do. And he spoke to them together. He spoke to them corporately. The Spirit of God gave a corporate consensus as he moved upon the hearts of those people. As they were fasting and praying and ministering, the Bible calls it, to the Lord. So just as they were, they were in service to the Lord, suddenly the Lord spoke to them. Why do we need to be in God's service? Why do, why do we need to be together? Because it's during those times that God speaks corporately to the church. And God says, this is what I want you to do. And so we need to be in tune to the Spirit. I, I mentioned we're going to have some planning sessions and dreaming times. I'm gonna, I like to call them. You know, there are going to be times when we gather together and the Lord is going to say, do this or do that. And, and I think what's going to happen is there will be uh, people that say, you know, the Lord spoke to me in the same way. And there's a consensus then of what God wants us to do. The, the direction that God wants us to take and, and to minister to him. But simply as they were ministering to the Lord, maybe in prayer, maybe in worship, we don't know, but they're ministering to the Lord. They're praying and fasting also. And God says, through the power of the Holy Spirit, this is what I want you to do. And we need to be open to those. We need to be open to those, those times. One other uh, illustration in the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah wanted to know God's will about this great building program that God had set before him. It's something precious to me here. In Nehemiah 7, verse 5. He says, and my, could you read that underlined part with me? God put it into my heart. Now, how did God speak to him? He spoke to him by putting a vision, a, a burden, a task in his heart. And my God put it into my heart to gather together the nobles and the rulers and the people. That is God's plan for his people, uh, according to Nehemiah. And I believe that when we pray, God knows how to speak to our heart. God knows how to speak to the human heart. And then another way that God directs our paths is through providence. In uh, the book of Revelation, 
God writes <laughs> to a particular church there. He says, I am he that opens and no man shuts. I am he that shuts and no man opens. Before, behold, I have set before you an open door. So when God opens doors, he is leading us and he is guiding us. And we have to look for open doors. All right. Now the divine dynamic. That word direct. I love this. That word direct. God will direct our paths. Is the Hebrew word yashar. And it literally means to cut a path. Or to clear the way. Some of you have a translation other than the King James there. It will read something like this. He shall make your path straight. Or another translation. He shall make your path smooth. Smooth. Uh, because that is the literal rendering of this word, yashar. And the idea actually is this, not only leading, but leading by clearing the way. What happens is that God actually just clears the way for the child of God. In Isaiah chapter 40, it speaks of John the Baptist. And it says, The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Listen to it. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. And then he says, Every valley shall be exalted, every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain. You know what God does for the man of God? You know what God does for the woman of God? You know what God does for the child of God? He bulldozes a way. He makes a way. Do you know what God does for the person who trusts in him with all of their heart and acknowledges him? Doesn't lean on their own understanding, but in all their ways they acknowledge him and make him known. He bulldozes away through the wilderness. That's exactly what it means. It means he will go and he will prepare the way. He will take the mountains and the mountains will melt. He will take the valleys and he'll fill them in. He will take the crooked places and he will make them straight. He will take the rough places, and he will make them smooth. This is what God will do for the man or woman, child of his, that steps into the stream of his spirit. That mountain, that obstacle, God will send an angel with a bulldozer. And that mountain, that obstacle in your life that seems so, seems so insurmountable, that mountain will come down. But as Zechariah tells us, it's not by our might, it's not by our power, but it's by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. And I want you to know today, church, that there is no man on earth, there is no devil from hell, there is no force, there is no power that can stop the people of God when they are filled with the spirit. It just can't happen. It, it just can't happen. And what will God, what will God do for you if you trust in him with all of your heart? And, and you don't lean on your own understanding, but in all of your ways, you acknowledge him. You make him known. What is God going to do for you when you acknowledge him in, in, in all of your ways? The big things in life, the little things in life, your, your social life, your public life, in all of your ways, you acknowledge him. I'll tell you what's going to happen. I can begin to hear right now the angel come and start the engine to that bulldozer and begin to rub up its engine. And God is going to make a path for you. And this is the way. This is the way. And this is the lesson that we need to learn, church. The lesson that we need to learn that the way to walk in darkness and find God's way is by trusting him with all of our heart, seeking his wisdom, not leaning on our own understanding, but acknowledging him in all of our ways. And then he's going to come and he's going to level those mountains. And he's going to fill up those valleys and he's going to make those rough places smooth again. And even the curves and the crookedness in life, he's going to make straight. Now, I didn't say this was going to be an easy thing, right? Because there are mountains and there are valleys. They are there. They are real. And I'm not saying we're not going to face these kinds of obstacles. What I'm saying is 
that we can overcome them as we walk in the Spirit, as we step into the stream of the Spirit of God. And that is how we find God's way in a dark world. I believe that 2021 is going to be a year of choices. There are going to be a lot of decisions that you are going to have to make in 2021. You're going to have to make some choices. I, should I name some of them? You're going to have to make some choices about what you're going to do with your children in public school, government schools. I mean, I, I hate to say it, but you're going to have to make some choices. Now, there, you, I'm not saying that you can't send your kids, but what, I guess not my place. But what I am saying is this. You need to find out what they're being taught. You need to find out what the curriculum is that is being taught in those schools because there is a big push to go away from what you and I learned in school about the history of our nation and, and things like that. There's a big push. And you need to know what's being taught. You need to know what you're going to do with that vaccine if you're, if you're being asked to take it. And again, I'm not, it's not my place to tell you whether you should take that vaccine or not, but I would give you a warning. And, and I think I might tell you some of the concerns that, that, uh, that I have for it. But you at least need to do this. You at least need to get before God and say, God, I need, I need wisdom. And you need to know what's in the vaccine and you need to know what the vaccine has the potential to do. So what I'm saying is this is a year where you're going to need wisdom like any other year. Please don't lean on your own understanding. Please, please study things out and ask for wisdom from God and ask for wisdom for, from other people because the tough choices that you're going to have to make are there. But I, I, I know that God will be with you and he will direct you if you, if you just lean upon him not your own understanding, but you lean and you put your trust in him. Those mountains that we think are impossible, God can, God can move them. He's the God of the impossible. And I, that's my prayer for you this year is that you will seek wisdom like you've never sought it before. And you won't lean on your own understanding, but together and as individuals, as a church and as an individual, we will do our best to acknowledge God in everything, in all of our ways, and put our trust there. And we know that he'll smooth down those mountains. He'll fill those valleys. He'll make the crooked places straight, and he'll make the rough areas smooth. Would you commit yourself to the Lord this morning? It's a tough message, I know. I know it is. But I honestly believe if you're going to make it through and if you're going to see God's way in a dark world, in a dark, dark day, dark world, you're going to have to totally commit yourself to him. And when you totally commit yourself to him, you'll see some thrilling things that he's going to do through you. He's going to, we're going to see some thrilling things that he's going to do with this church. This is not a time, this is not a time to be on the sidelines. This is the time to get all, both, both feet get in on God's side and jump in. Like, like Elijah challenged the people in the days of the prophets of Baal as he called down fire from heaven to consume the sacrifice at Mount Carmel. He said, you need to make a decision. Whose God are you going to serve? You're going to serve the God of the Israelites or the gods of Baal? And the people said, the Lord, he is our God. He's our God. If you'd say today, the Lord, Jehovah God, he is my God. And put your faith and your trust there. You'll make it. And that's the message that you and I need to share with this lost and confusing world in which we live. We need to pray for those because many of them are honestly in mental darkness. And it's because they've leaned on their own understanding. May God gives us, give us words of wisdom for them. Hey, had your heads bowed, your eyes closed.
the first thing you need to make your way and see your way in a dark day is you need to come to Jesus. There is no other way, but you need to come to him today and you need to confess him as Savior and Lord. Repenting of your sins, asking forgiveness. You say, well, I haven't sinned. I'm, I'm not as bad as, as most people. Truth of the matter is, we've all sinned and fallen short of God's glory. The standard is Jesus himself, and we all fall short. In comparison, our righteousness is as filthy rags. And we need to have the forgiveness of sin, and we need to be born again, as Jesus told Nicodemus. A man, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You cannot see God's wisdom. You cannot see what God is doing in his kingdom without this born again experience. Other than that, you'll be walking, you will be walking in darkness. But Jesus came and he came to give you life and he came to give you light. So if you are here today or if you are listening through streaming or whatever means, if you have not done so, would you right now say, Jesus, I, would you forgive me of my sins? I confess that I have sinned. And I acknowledge my need of you today and my need for your forgiveness. And I believe that you died for me on the cross. And I believe that you died for my sins. And now I receive you into my heart and my life and I confess you as my Savior. I confess you as my Lord and he will move in to your heart. You will be born again. You will be given a new set of eyes that you will see things that you have never saw before that you'll be able to see by the Spirit of God. And then, Christian, you know where I'm going with this next one. Are you willing to trust the Lord with all your heart? If you can't say, I can't trust him right now, I can appreciate that. I can appreciate that. But again, the reason that you, that you don't trust him is because you don't love him like you should and you don't love him like you should because you don't know him. So could you at least say, Lord, I am going to, I'm going to get to know you better in 2021 than I have at any other time in my life because I want to be able to trust you and I want to be able to, to love you and so, Lord, I'm, I'm going to make it my goal this year to get to know you better. And I'll tell you, God will remind you of that this year. If you start to wander, God will say, hey, remember that church service at Calvary Assembly of God in Wilson? That first Sunday of this year, you said you wanted to get to know me better, and you said you would spend time with me. And he'll remind you of that. I know he'll be faithful to do that. So a lot of it's on his shoulders. But you do what you can, and he'll take care of the rest. Father, today we just want to commit ourselves to you again. Commit our, ourselves as individuals, commit ourselves as a church body. Lord, to just to trust in you this year. Lord, and, and to seek your wisdom and to seek your face. Lord, that at no point would we just lean on our own understanding. But Lord, would, would you speak to us with words of wisdom? Would you speak to us through your word? Would you speak to us to our heart by your spirit? Would you speak to us by opening and closing doors, both for the church and for us as individuals and, our, and other things that we are involved in? Lord, we trust in your providence today. We trust in your sovereignty. And Lord, I ask for some thrilling things to happen, both in the church and with individuals. That we could look back next year at this time and say, you know, that was a thrilling year to serve the Lord. Despite everything else, I'm thrilled that I served you. Lord, I ask that you would bless our time of fellowship and the food that has been provided today as well. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So God bless you. Chili. Down the hall.